Hi everybody, this is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics. So on this video, I'm just gonna briefly cover some of the different types of room correction that have come out recently uh, dealing with bass and how they compare with some of the other products on the market. So there's been a lot of misinformation that I've noticed floating around. And in fact, I'm gonna do some really deep dives on this, probably more with Audioholics than my own channel. I may put some stuff on my own channel as well. I'd like to follow it with actual tests to show you, but a lot of it probably needs to also be more on the theory end of things to help explain how these work. So let's just start with the problem. One of the big problems that we need to address with room acoustic treatments is that we need to reduce the number of reflections in the room or the level of those reflections. And at low frequencies, it's actually a pretty simple problem. At mid and high frequencies, we actually want reflections. It's just that we want a certain kind of reflection in a certain way from certain places in the room. And we don't want other reflections from other places. Um, so as an example, we don't want a lot of reflections from immediately around the speaker. Those are early reflections. Those are not helpful. We do like a lot of later reflections, but we like them to not be particularly strong. And we like them to be fairly even and to have fairly random phase. That's how a large room would work. It sounds much more spacious and enveloping in that way. Strong late reflections tend to just sound like as if you have a, like a surround speaker right there blasting at you. You don't want that. That's why we use a lot of diffusers and we stick observers in key locations. At low frequencies though, those reflections are basically just causing a problem. The reflections cause peaks and dips in the response. What people know as, they call it like modes or resonances in the room, all of that's true, but modes are actually a very specific kind of reflection interference problem, which is that when sound bounces around the room and those reflections then hit each other along with hitting the direct sound, at that location in the room, you get a peak or a dip. There's another kind known as speaker boundary interference response, and that's that when the sound bounces around the room and then comes back to the direct sound being created by the speaker at a later point in time, because the phase has now been shifted, there is a peak or a dip that gets created. That, so the difference is this, with a mode, that depends on the position in the room that you, the listener, are, and whether you're gonna see that mode or a different mode. For SBIR, it doesn't matter where you are in the room, you're gonna have that peak or dip because it's actually being formed at the point of the speaker. So it doesn't really matter though, whether it's SBIR or modes, they're all caused by reflections. And the only way to fix them is to uh, get rid of those reflections. There are ways to address it that actually work with the reflections. So when I say the only way to fix it, the only way to like completely eliminate it would be to eliminate those reflections, but you can make a much more smooth response that also has a larger area for which you get a smooth response by essentially energizing the room from more different spatial locations. And that's what some people know as the Harmon or, or the Welty approach. Earl Geddes was the person who taught it to me, so he had his own way of doing it. So if you do that around the room in, in enough different locations, three to four is kind of the minimum to really get the full effect. Um, you can go higher and you can get even better effect, but four is kind of a, a like magic number where you tend to see the most improvement uh, that you're, you know, everything after that is like diminishing returns. So um, that is just energizing the room more and more and more. And uh, it's doing it from different locations so that what happens is sort of an averaging out of the peaks and dips, and then you can EQ everything. Well, there's another way you can do this. Like I said, you can just get rid of those. And the old way of doing that was a passive way. So you would have all these reflections all around the room, and you would put absorbers where the reflections are happening, and they'd have to be really thick. In fact, at low enough frequencies, we'd be talking two to three feet thick to have any real effect on this. And then you wouldn't get all that uh, uh, all those peaks and dips. But it's really unrealistic to take a room and give up, I mean, let's just say you needed two feet of insulation per wall. So you're giving up four feet of floor space in every in, in the room. So the length is, becomes four feet shorter and the width becomes four feet shorter to put all that in. That's pretty unrealistic. It also would absorb way too much high frequency sound. I mean, there's just lots of reasons not to wanna do this. So then there comes this idea of using active cancellation approaches. And active cancellation approaches are, a better way of doing this. It's much more efficient because it's the size of the speakers, that's it. And so some of the early approaches to doing this were actually things that look like subwoofers, but they weren't connected to the system and they didn't reproduce the sound. All they did was they had a microphone that would detect sound, create a special filtered response, essentially it just inverts and, and delays it. Well, the delay is kind of built in, it just inverts it. 
plays it back and that cancels the reflection at at least a, to a point. And that helps to get rid of some of the modes. Um, if you have enough of these, two or three or four of these things, you can you can see some pretty good benefits. But it wasn't perfect. It only worked at, at the point at which you place those, and um, it, it, they typically are pretty expensive too. So some of the further advancements past that uh, involved using different techniques for actively canceling with the speakers you have in the room. So one of the older techniques that didn't really use very advanced. DSP was known as the double base array. And the double base array basically places subwoofers on the wall. So the key is it has to be on the wall or in the wall. Either is okay. And they need to be placed across the whole wall, floor to ceiling, left to right. The bare minimum typically is four. I mean, I think in theory you could do two at like a, like a quarter in on one side, a quarter in on the other side, but like kind of in the middle and get some benefit. But that's not really, it's, it's not a great way to do it. It would be very limited bandwidth. The, the best way to do this would be four plus. So if you do four, it's a quarter in, quarter up, quarter in, quarter down. And you'll have a, there is a limit. So there's a point at which this, at the higher frequencies isn't gonna work right anymore. But within reason, that's gonna create a planar wave. Planar waves are kind of more like a, instead of being like a bulbous spherical shape, planar waves tend to have more of a cylinder type shape to them. And they don't reflect, basically. They don't reflect off of the floor and ceiling and they don't reflect off of the left and the right side walls. But they will reflect off of the back wall still. And so they're gonna go, it's gonna, this, this planar base wave is gonna travel through the room, it's gonna pass you, it's gonna hit the back wall, and then it's gonna come back and it's gonna cancel itself. And so you're still gonna have length modes. Well, if you place the exact same array on the back wall, you delay it by the length of the room, and you invert it, it's gonna cancel that. So now all of a sudden you have nothing. There are no reflections at low frequencies. So for the sake of argument, since these are subwoofers, we'll say crossed at 80 Hertz, you now have perfect bass. This idea was tested. It worked extremely well. And you end up with, it's anechoic bass basically, reflection free bass. It's no different than if you took the system outside and played that way. Very, very tight, very clean, very quick decay. It's the decay rate basically of the woofer now. The room no longer is causing bass to drone on at all. And it, there's just, you cannot equal what this does with passive treatments. But everything I just described to you should sound kind of unreasonable, including typically you need more than just the eight subwoofers, the four in the front and four in the back. You probably need more like six and six, so 12 or more. I mean, you could need 18 subwoofers potentially with larger walls, again, or more if it's a really large wall. So I would say six to, to nine subwoofers on the front and back, so 12 to 18 is pretty realistic and you get no benefit from those back subwoofers. So you don't really, if you have the six on the front and the six in the back, the base output is actually only equal to the six on the front because the back ones are only being used for cancellation. They are not contributing to base output. So it's inefficient, it's expensive, it's complicated. Most people can't mount them like that. It was a neat idea, but I just never thought of it as being particularly realistic. So then you've got what Dirac has come out with. So one of the other things you can do is you can use a similar kind of feed forward technique where you take and you, you just know basically where the sound is gonna be as it's traversing through the room and coming back. And you can create these signals that are processed in a very particular way. And at this point, it's not just delay anymore. And it's not just phase inversion. There's more to what's going on. So there is some frequency uh, manipulation there's the time domain stuff going on, the phase shift. Yes, they're related, but in this case, they're, they're handled separately for a reason. And that can be sent out to specific speakers, bandwidth limited based on what the speaker can handle, to cancel sound within a specific frequency range. And if you do this over a large enough area, which was surround systems, you have a lot of speakers. So you actually have a lot of room to do this you can actually expand the bandwidth over what this does. And it's, to me, much more feasible because everybody who has a surround system has speakers already all around the room. It's become pretty common to have three, four subwoofers. A lot of people are okay with having more. I mean, you could have four in the corners, two on the sides, you know. So this is not an unrealistic or crazy idea. And so these subwoofer systems with all the speakers using Dirac's art, active room treatment approach, allows you then to get up to like 
500 to 700 hertz, maybe even a little higher, of really, really clean decay. I mean, there's going to be a certain point at the lowest frequencies where it is going to drone on a bit, and that's because every system is bandwidth limited, and at the lowest of the bandwidth, you're going to see a rise in group delay. It's just how systems work, and you can't cancel that out or get rid of it. It's, it's kind of inherent in the system. Um, but it will be minimized to the lowest that it possibly can be, and the decay rate you're going to get in the base range between, let's say, 500 hertz and, like, let's say, 25 or 30 hertz is going to be extremely quick. It's going to be like as if you measure the subwoofers and speakers all outside. And you don't need any passive treatments that operate in that range. You still need passive treatments above that range, but in that range, you really wouldn't need passive treatments because the system is already going to be doing a better job than those passive treatments could have. Now, this is a little bit idealized. In practice, you may find that it doesn't work that well, especially with lower channel counts, and you may find that you need to add some treatments, but it would at least dramatically reduce it. So that's what Dirac is doing. Then you have Trinov. So Trinov came out, and they've released almost no information, <laughs> but there, more information will be coming very, very soon. Um, but they basically said, we've done a lot of research, we've continued our great work in this area, and we have developed a bunch of very significant advancements, and we are going to release those advancements in stages. But stage one is going to be a new advanced approach to doing the double base array. So that's the subwoofers on the front and the back. They showed this off at ISE, and the system that was done there had, I believe I have this right, 18 subwoofers. So they did a large number of subwoofers, and they were optimally placed. What I don't know yet and what we need to find out, but I have already contacted them and we have a plan to have a meeting and discuss how it works once, uh, you know, once they can talk about it. And then hopefully some more will be learned. But um, you know, how perfect do the subs need to be? I think a large number is going to be needed no matter what. But do they need to be in exactly the right location, or does the DSP have the ability to correct for some of these anomalies? I also, you know, I'm kind of curious, like, what else are they doing in the DSP? They have assured me that this is not just a DBA. And, you know, the, the way it was put to me was, Matt, we know you understand DBAs. We know you understand how this works. This is more than that. We promise you it's more than that. We just can't talk about it. Why? The patent hadn't actually been fully filed and processed yet, and they don't want to release any information because who knows? I got a big mouth. I might mess up their business. So that is not really what's going on. But the, you know, the, the point was they needed to be uh, careful in what they release. Um, I've since seen a lot of people on the forum say that they think that these systems are awful, that they're regurgitating old, old ideas, that they didn't work before and they're not going to work now. I've also heard some people claim that they already were doing this and they've been doing it for years. You may have done the DBA, that is an old idea, but you're not doing the DBA the way Trinov is doing, or at least you can't claim you know you are because they haven't told us what they're doing yet. But they've been very adamant that what they're doing is much more complex than the standard DBA approach. And then in the case of Direct Art, again, no way you're doing that, and no way you've been doing that, because it's a very complicated approach. Besides the fact that it's very difficult to feed the signals back to the other channels while also playing music to them for surround duty, so you have to mix in, basically, in whatever DSP processor you're using, all the surround information plus very specific steered subwoofer base information up to possibly 5700 hertz. You'd have to be doing this with some sort of an FIR creator to create the files, the mixed phase correction files that you would need. You would have to understand how to do those FIR correction files. They're not room inversions. This is, there's way more going on than that. And so I don't believe anybody's been doing that. This is too complex for something to, for you to do on your own. Um, and I think even really, really good calibrators are gonna wanna look at these systems as a tool that helps them do their job better. You know, in the case of Trinov, this is not something the average person can set up. It's a design approach mixed with a fairly complicated calibration approach, but they're providing the DSP tools to do it. Same thing's true with Dirac. Yes, it's very automated, but there's still a design approach and there's still a knowing how to use the tool correctly calibration approach part to it. So I do think that there's going to be something to be said for that, but I do think that Dirac, which is always aimed to a wider audience than Trinov, is also going to have more mass appeal, and I, I think that's a good thing. I would love to see Trinov expand what they're doing, which they said they will, to something that itself has more mass appeal, but I think all of it is really exciting. These are very advanced new approaches to base management, and I would say anybody that's writing them off, just give them a chance. Hear them with open ears and open eyes, because I think that you'll be impressed. These are different than what people have done, and it's not something that's easily recreated on your own. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe.